Well, the next talk is uh, given by Philip. It's a joint work with Fabrizio De Santis, Jon Heisel, and Georg Siegel, and it's about FPGA implementations of Diffie-Hellman on the camera surface of genus 2 curves. All right, thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone. So in this talk, I'm going to present two highly optimized FPGA implementations that use a genus 2 hyperelliptic curve to enable very fast Diffie-Hellman key exchanges. So the main question that we tried to answer in our work um, was to evaluate how efficiently we can implement a hyperelliptic curve-based scheme um, on an FPGA, and if so, how it compares with uh, similar elliptic curve prime fit implementations. And to answer that right away, so we will see that our performs are quite decent, and in fact, it outperforms all previous comparable works in terms of latency and throughput. Now, when we usually operate in time sensitive environments, what we usually do is, of course, that we want to use um, elliptic curve cryptography. Why do we do that? Um, fast arithmetic, small key sizes, and all of you know the, the benefits. And this raises naturally a question, question why, do we need, uh, why do we need hyperelliptic curve cryptography? And um, so what are the benefits of hyperelliptic curve cryptography and also what is the related work in that topic? And for that I would like to give you a quick overview about the different works that we've seen in the past few years. Um, we will mostly um, discuss here two, um, uh, two works that are elliptic curve based, which is the well-known curve, Curve 25519 from Daniel Bernstein. And then we will also um, compare our work to the um, very efficient implementation, um, the, the 4Q work. And bo both of those, both of those um, elliptic curve based schemes have been implemented in uh, 2014 and 2016 on an FPGA. The nice thing about those two implementations is that they have very similar optimization goals. Both of them present two architectures, one targeting low latency, the other one targeting high throughput, and uh, we will see how we align our results to them. Now, the only hyperelliptic curve-based scheme that you see here, or the only implementation that you see here, is the one from Bose et al., which got published in 2013. And um, that was actually the first work um, or the first software implementation that used the Kummer surface um, of a genus 2 or the Kummer surface of Gautry and Schoss uh, genus 2 curve. And everyone basically knew already before that uh, this should theoretically perform quite well and they actually um, proved it by that. But what is still missing so far um, is the proof for the hardware implementation and that's what we will try um, to answer in that talk. Now, um, before, we, before we jump into the implementation, let's probably take a look how hyperelliptic curves are different to elliptic curves and also how the group operation is different to elliptic curves. Now, first of all, how, how is a hyperelliptic curve different to an elliptic curve? You distinguish them by their definition. So elliptic curve um, has a, has a so-called, or in general, curves are, def um, are described by a so-called genus. Genus is uh, the direct uh, relation to the, uh, to the degree of the polynomial um, that the curve is described with. In case of elliptic curves, curves are said to be of genus 1, which is degree 3. And in case of hyperelliptic curves, or in our case, we use so-called genus 2 curves with our curves of uh, degree 5. Now, when you take a look at that curve, and we, we, if, you would, or if you want now to, to design some kind of um, uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange where you need a scalar multiplication, and then, of course, you also need some group operation, if you take a look at that curve, which is a hyperelliptic curve, um, if you would try now to, to use the standard cotton tangent rule, it wouldn't work. Why? Because, of course, if I would draw now a line through this curve, it would probably intersect in five points and you can't construct the group operation. What we do instead in that case is, um, instead of having this one-to-one -one correspondence between a group element and a single point, as it is for the elliptic curve cryptography, we have, in that case, um, two points, um, for example, P1 and P2 and those have a certain structure, and those points together form one group element. Same thing we can do here for Q1 and Q2. Now, when you want to determine now the group operation, what you do is quite similar, actually, to elliptic curve cryptography. Um, you determine some kind of polynomial that has now a degree 3, and this polynomial, again, will intersect um, the curve in the, all those points, and, of course, then also into further points, and always into further points, 
which is R1 and R2. Then you do the same thing as with elliptic curve cryptography, you mirror them across the x-axis, and you obtain your group operation. Now, last thing to clarify, and that is probably you are asking yourself, what is now the Cuma surface? Um, I don't want to answer here what it actually is. I think it's more interesting to see what it does and uh, uh, where the benefits are. So the, what the Cuma surface does is when you map the points from the, let's say, standard representation towards the Cuma surface, what you do there is that you identify the group elements um, with their inverses. And if you're familiar with elliptic curve cryptography, um, you've probably done that already, because that is essentially the same thing as um, for elliptic curve cryptography, where you have the x-only arithmetic, meaning where you're dropping the y-coordinate. And of course, the Kuma surface, you use that uh, to speed up the operation. Now, what does it mean implementation-wise, and how, how do they differ now from each other? So in that case, now the Kuma surface-based implementation, and as an example, curve 25519. And there are two interesting parameters um, that you can compare here, and that is, first of all, the field size, and then you have also, then you have also the field operations per letter step. Now, the nice thing with the Kuma surface-based um, implementation, or with the, with the specific um, Kuma surface of Gautry and Schoss curve, is that you have a field size that is half the size of curve 25519, namely 127 bits, which, of course, gives you a great advantage in terms of implementing the field operations. On the other hand, you have this increase um, of the field operations per letter step, um, which raises the question, essentially, um, does the reduced field size outweigh this um, increase for the field operations per letter step? Now, before we jump into the actual implementation, let's um, take a look at the functions that we need to implement. And first of all, the, the functions that you see here, we didn't come up with them, though they, those got published in, in some other works already before, and we would simply use them. And in a sense, we need to implement three functions. That is an unwrapping function, the scalar multiplication, and the wrapping function. Now, the scalar multiplication is known. I think that is standard. You have some input point P, or some group element in that case, that you, that you multiply then with your secret um, key K to obtain, to obtain your either shared secret or your, um, your public key um, Q. Now, you also have those, those, uh, those two wrapping and unwrapping functions. Um, the two rep, uh, the, uh, why do you do that? Um, because this is probably not known from elliptic curve cryptography. As you can see here, um, the bit size of the, of the input group element of the input point is quite high. So we have here 508 bits. Now the wrapping function gives you the advantage that you reduce the size here of this point. And it also gives you an advantage for the scalar multiplication. Why? Because you use parts of the wrap point um, when you input it uh, into those functions. So you, you reuse some of, the, um, some of those to gain here speed up. From the operations that we need to implement, um, yeah, scalar multiplication is quite standard. Use the standard Montgomery ladder, which consists of modular multiplication, modular squaring, and then the so-called Hadamard transform, which is in the end um, just a chain of, of some additions and subtractions. For the wrapping function, then you also need a modular inversion, which is, uh, of course, known that it's quite uh, time intensive. Now, let's take a look um, at the implementation. So. We will present two implementations. The first one that we will talk here about is the so-called uh, single-core implementation, which means we are interested in multiplying just one point at a time, which means we are mostly interested in the latency here and not in the throughput of the implementation. Now, we realized the functions that we've seen before um, with th three building blocks, which is the control logic, which obviously um, provides the control signals for the other modules. Then we have some memory module, which consists of a distributed RAM. It's not a block RAM, it's distributed RAM, and also a register file. So the distributed RAM is to hold um, some, some uh, constants that we need, and the register file simply holds some temporary values that we get from the data path. Now, for the data path, we decided to implement um, three modules. That is the Hadamard module, that is the modular multiplier, and the constant modular multiplier. Um, we decided here not to implement a squaring module because the modular multiplier is already quite area intensive, and for that reason, we neglected it here. Now, um, we don't have enough time to talk about all those modules in detail, and for that reason, I decided to focus on two of them that are, in my opinion, probably um, the most interesting one and also the ones that are responsible for the performance that we achieve. And that is the modular multiplier and the control logic. So we will start with the modular multiplier. And for the modular multiplier, I apply three, um, let's say, techniques or principles. So the first one is we are interested in, in performance or in latency and later also in throughput. So the first, um, the first important thing is that we want to use a parallel multiplier, which means we want to compute all the single-digit products in full parallel, and we also want to accumulate all those 
um, digital products in full peril. Um, the second two techniques, um, the second one is that we use a so-called non-standardizing technique that got published um, a few years ago. And um, what it essentially does, it helps you to reduce the DSP blocks uh, um, that you need for computing those smaller digit products. And that is a very nice technique because it doesn't cost you any additional hardware. It simply, uh, uh, oh, sorry, of course it reduces the, the hardware, but it doesn't um, affect your performance or anything like that. Now the third one um, is um, combining multiplication and reduction procedure for better performance. And I would like to talk about that in the next few slides because uh, I think it's um, a bit different than we, than we know it. And uh, first of all, to be honest, that's also a work um, that we've done earlier. So we, we've published um, only a modular multiplier before and I just summarized the results here. Now when we usually perform multiplication uh, in MSM primes fields, we have essentially two steps. First one is, of course, multiplication. The second one is reduction. Now, for mesen primes, we have this very specific structure, um, which is p to, uh, well, the mesen prime equals uh, 2 to the power of p minus 1. And uh, this is actually a very nice structure um, because it allows us um, specific computational tricks. Um, now, in our case, p is 127, which means that also our, um, our field itself is 127 bits wide. Now, what you do, um, you multiply the two input operands, both p bits wide, um, obtain your results C, then in the next step um, you have some logic that performs a reduction, which means in that case, because we can use so-called Trandas reduction, take the upper part of C, shift it to the right and add it on the lower part of C, and you obtain your reduced result. Now, um, let's take a look um, how we do that, and I would like to start here with the picture on the left. So before we oversimplify things a bit, so if you usually perform a multiplication in FPGA, you need, of course, to decompose the large multiplication in smaller digit products that you can see now on the left. Um, what you do then is, once you, once you have computed those digit products with a standard algorithm such as schoolbook algorithm, um, you take all those, then you put them into an adder tree, which is in our case a fully parallel adder tree, and then you obtain your result C, and then you do the procedure that we've seen earlier, take the upper part of C, add it on the lower, and so on. Now, instead of doing this, what you can also do is, um, instead of computing the digit products, accumulating them, then shifting the, um, the result, you can also basically shift before you accumulate which means, um, which we can see now on the middle picture, that we take the upper far part before we accumulate it, shift it on the right. Now what happens is, if you would input this now into, um, into a hardware design, you would have, well, in, into an adder tree, you will have some unused bits. And that is, of course, um, not um, efficient, and uh, for, that you, for that reason we will try to avoid this. And what you can do here is, you can um, slice the digital products into their single bits, and then you can reorder them on a, on a vertical line. Horizontally is, of course, not possible because you would change the value of the bit. Now once you have done that, and once you have regrouped um, those um, bits, um, we are now on the picture on the right, and we see here we have a very nice symmetrically structure. And um, yeah, now it's quite easy to put that into an adder tree and to process that uh, with a very high maximum frequency. And uh, I should also mention here that we designed the modular multiplier and all other modules in such a way, or, or at least the finite field modules, in such a way um, that you can input in each cycle, you can input a new operand, um, which means we have basically no, no busy or, or any stalls here. Now, we did that first, then we continued with the other feed operations module, and once we had all those, we came, of course, to the scalar multiplication, where we needed to, um, to schedule the, the single feed operations. Now, um, you see now the scheduling, basically, for the feed operations, and here for the first ladder step. And for the, uh, then we see on the left here also the three modules um, that I've mentioned earlier, which is the Hadamard module, the modular multiplier, and the constant modular multiplier. The blue bars mark now um, whenever you schedule a new operation. So it doesn't mean when the output is valid or anything, it simply means when you schedule a new operation, which means in all those, uh, let's say, unused, um, unused cycles now, you could potentially schedule another operation. And that came then to the idea, um, why not schedule a second scalar multiplication in between, and potentially with the idea without losing any cycles here. And um, we did that, and uh, as you can see now, we have a second scalar multiplication interleaved, and the nice thing here is really that you don't lose anything in terms of performance. 
So the only thing, of course, we, we require some more area because we need to store some of the input operands in, in, some, in some memory. Um, there we, of course, have a disadvantage, but the advantage here is that you actually increase your throughput. If you would use that now, for example, for multiplying two points at a time, you can double your throughput. Now, in case if you are not interested in doubling your throughput and you say, okay, I am only interested in multiplying one point at a time, what you can do instead is you can use this as a fault countermeasure, um, meaning that you simply perform the scalar multiplication twice on the same input point and then, yeah, basically uh, perfor perform the equivalence check at the end of your computation. Now let's take a look at the results. So we will start um, again now with a single core implementation and we will compare our work, as I've mentioned earlier, to 4Q and Curve 25519. Now in terms of latency, um, I think uh, there it's, it's quite obvious we outperform um, the two other works, which is probably more interesting is, take, uh, is to take a look at the area. And here we clearly have to admit that in terms of um, slices and also in these P blocks, we suffer compared to the other implementations. Now I also want to note here that you should, um, or that you, that you consider the ratio between latency and area, and there we are, um, we, we, I think we, we are at least comparable or even outperform the two other works. Now last thing, uh, BRAM, we don't use any BRAM, which I don't know, could be probably nice for further functionality on your FPGA, um, so we neg uh, neglected that. Now let's uh, come to the multi-core implementation. Um, again, the multi-core implementation has the goal to compute basically as many points as you can per second, so throughput. And um, the constraints here are that you have your, um, your FPGA, and I forgot to mention that, we all use the same FPGA, which is, uh, which is the Zing 7020 FPGA. Now what you do is you try to put basically as many cores as you can um, on the board, and then you measure the performance. It's a bit weird, but uh, that's also how the, the two other works uh, have done it earlier. Um, so we followed their um, the example, and then again for the throughput, we um, see a very similar result. In that case, of, of course, we activated now um, the feature where we can double the, the throughput. And then for slices and DSP blocks, um, things are similar, but um, I would say a bit more, um, like the comparison itself is now a bit more fair, at least um, compared to, f um, to Curve 25519. Again, um, 4Q itself here has a uh, much lower area utilization. And for BRAM, of course, we have the same as before. Now, um, I would like to conclude my talk and give you three take-home messages. So the first one is to come back to the initial question that I asked myself in the beginning, um, whether we can achieve such a um, high-speed implementation um, based on a Kuma surface. And yes, um, it is possible to do that on FPGA. And um, on the other hand, and that is the second point, I also want to be careful with the comparison. Why? Um, we use very specifically optimized um, modules in the end, so the modular multiplier is extremely optimized, and also this technique with interleaved scalar multiplication, of course, give us, gives us a huge advantage in terms of throughput. And those techniques you could potentially also apply to the similar or to the comparable works, um, Curve to 5519 and um, 4Q. Now, the last point um, is just basically to re-emphasize, so hyperelliptic curve cryptography is an inter interesting alternative to um, elliptic curve cryptography, but we require more research. For example, area-optimized um, area uh, implementation would be interesting or similar comparable things. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Any questions? People are warming up. I have a quick question. Yeah. On um, which hardware platforms did you implement that? It's on which FPGAs? And are they similar um, to the ones you compared? And how many different platforms did you compare it on? Um, we only compared one, one platform, and that is the SYNC 7020 FPGA. We used basically the exact same version that uh, the other works mentioned for easier comparison. Thank you. Still no questions? Hello? Hello? Oh. Uh, the, you said you made the adder tree. The adder tree is made by compressors, or you just put a lot of additions and let the two solve for you? Yeah, so in that case, um, we didn't really optimize the adders themselves, so we simply instantiated those and then took basically all the, or told the synthesis tool to synthesize them. So we didn't really optimize them by, by hand.
And for the timing, is the adder tree the bottleneck or not? Yes, it's the adder tree that is the bottleneck. And uh, basically, by by aligning those those levels that we've seen from the um, earlier, what I showed, um, the nice thing is that basically all the stages from the adder tree operate on a very similar maximum frequency. So you don't have one stage that is faster than the other one. So we pipeline all those, and yeah. Okay. All right. Let's thank the speaker again.